Developing right now on Morning News Now, a critical clue from this shocking near disaster 16,000 feet off the ground. Investigators have recovered part of a Boeing 737 that came off during the flight. He found it in his backyard. There was a lot of uh, damage to paneling, to trim, uh, to the windows. Now nearly 200 similar planes have been grounded as the investigation grows. We will bring you the latest. Also this morning, new questions and calls for transparency over the hospitalization of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. What we know about his condition and why the Pentagon says it waited three days to tell the White House. Plus, parts of the country digging out from a major winter storm that brought a mix of rain and snow to several states. It's not over yet. We're tracking what you can expect as you start the work week. And the award goes to, we will bring you the biggest moments from last night's Golden Globes, including some historic wins, shocking losses, plus the biggest winner of the night. We both stayed up and watched some of it. We did, so if we're a little tired, yeah. you might be a little tired too, but yeah. hopefully you enjoyed the show. Good morning. Good to have you with us on this Monday. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to get started with the investigation into that nightmare scenario in the sky. This morning, the NTSB is analyzing a door plug that detached from an Alaska Airlines plane on Friday mid-flight. Officials say it was actually found in a backyard in Portland, Oregon, and it could be key in helping investigators determine what caused the Boeing 737's cabin wall panel to blow open. No one was seriously hurt, but the near disaster is now sending shock waves through the aviation industry worldwide. The FAA chief announced that nearly 200 other similar planes in the U.S. will remain grounded as they search for answers. And as NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello explains, agencies across the world are doing the same. New images show the focus of the NTSB's investigation. The gaping hole where a sealed and plugged door hole blew out in a violent explosion as the brand new Alaska Airlines plane was flying at 16,000 feet on its way from Portland to Ontario, California. The pilots wearing oxygen masks forced to make an emergency landing back in Portland. Alaska, 1282, we just depressed as we're declaring emergency. We need to descend down to 10,000. There was a big uh, boom or a, a mini explosion in the rear of the plane. Passengers described a terrifying flight. Moisture and fluid, almost like a cloud rushing from the front of the plane to the back of the plane. Blew my hat back. Folks in front of me, their hair was blown back. Evan Granger sitting several rows in front of the hole. I didn't want to look back to see what was happening. Uh, I knew something happened and my focus in that moment was just breathe into the oxygen mass and um, trust that the flight crew will will do everything they can to keep us safe. Thankfully, no one was sitting in seats 26A or B next to the hole. But the NTSB chief says nearby seats are twisted and bent. The empty seats headrest and seat cushions missing, sucked out of the plane. A teenage boy sitting one row forward had his shirt ripped off. It happened behind the plane's left wing. An emergency exit door hole cut in case airlines want to carry more passengers. Otherwise, that door is plugged and sealed, leaving an ordinary window. Investigators will be looking at whether that plug was properly bolted in place during manufacturing. Inside the plane, the wind violently pulled the cockpit door free, slamming it against the lavatory. Damage throughout the plane. Had the explosion occurred at cruising altitude, it could have been catastrophic. Something like that at 34,000, 35,000 feet, it's not just cold weather you're looking at. You're looking at a, a lack of oxygen and pretty significant consequences very early from that lack of oxygen and folks in the in the cabin. With the FAA grounding the MAX 9, airlines around the world have been forced to cancel hundreds of flights. In the U.S., Alaska canceling 170, United 180, saying it's waiting for the FAA to provide directions. Well, our thanks to Tom Costello for that report. Well, the NTSB says the plane's black boxes have now arrived in Washington, D.C. for further analysis and investigators have interviewed the crew. For more, we're joined now by former FAA and NTSB investigator Jeff Gazzetti, who's also an NBC aviation analyst. Jeff, good to have you with us right now. So talk us through the process of this investigation. What are investigators looking for and how important was finding this door plug? 
Well, it was very important that they found that door plug. Uh, and that's a late breaking uh, news item because now they'll be able to marry up the door plug that they found on the ground with the remnants of the hole that were in the side of the, the fuselage. And they'll be able to marry up paint transfer marks, uh, damage to the attached fittings, those types of things. Meanwhile, they're gonna be continuing to interview flight attendants, passengers. Uh, they're gonna collect information from the flight data recorder. The cockpit voice recorder, unfortunately, though, was overwritten. So that did the, the voice recording didn't capture the flight. But uh, they're gonna be doing a lot of work now, metallurgy work with the actual broken pieces. Yeah, that recording piece of this is so unfortunate. Apparently every two hours, right, it kind of starts to reset itself and it hadn't been shut off. So it just gets recorded over something that they're now looking at changing. Um, Jeff, have you ever seen anything that really compares to this before? Are there similar incidents that investigators could look to to help guide them either in terms of the damage or, or the particular aircraft? There have been, Savannah. There uh, probably within the last uh, 10, 15 years, I can recall of four events involving a uh, in-flight rapid decompression. Two of them involved 737s. They were both Southwest Airlines events, but it didn't involve a door plug like this. It involved the, uh, the, the lap joints of structure on top of the aircraft. They let loose at 30, 35,000 feet. Uh, no one was injured in either of those, and it turned out to be a manufacturing issue. Uh, then there was, of course, the fatal accident involving that uh, Southwest 737 that had a nacelle come off, hit the side of the fuselage, partially open up a window, and that uh, uh, that mother that was half sucked out and killed because of it. Um, that was because of a nacelle problem that bounced up against the side of the airplane. Um, and then there was the United Airlines cargo flight door that had electrical connectors and things like that. None, of, none translate directly to this. But still, the uh, effects inside the cockpit and the cabin were the same. You've been in the air safety industry for decades. As this investigation moves forward, we know it's going to take several months. What is it you're going to be watching out for? I'm going to be watching out for what airlines report back to the FAA with regards to this emergency airworthiness directive. So basically, it's, uh, it's a directive that says you can't fly your airplane until you inspect this door seal area and uh, hopefully no one will come back to say oh yeah we have this problem too um so that that's what i'm waiting to hear is how widespread this problem is or whether or not it was a one-off and then secondly later on the ntsb is going to get to the root cause of exactly why this door plug came off was it a manufacturing issue was it a design issue uh was it a maintenance issue um, so that's what I'm looking to hear from, but it's going to take several months for the NTSB to get to the bottom of that. All right, Jeff Gazzetti, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate your time. Now let's get to some news out of the Pentagon. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has been in the hospital since New Year's Day, but the Pentagon did not inform the White House National Security Council until Thursday. That's three days after he arrived at Walter Reed Medical Center in Maryland. In a statement, the Pentagon said that the defense secretary was hospitalized Monday because of complications from a recent medical procedure. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News White House correspondent Monica Alba and Pentagon correspondent Courtney Cuby. Good morning to both of you. Thanks for joining us, Courtney. I will begin with you. So we know the Pentagon waited days, as we just said before, informing officials about this hospital. Hospitalization. Are there any new details first about his condition and then why he was admitted? Uh, as far as his condition, is, all we know is that he's still hospitalized as of this morning. So it's been about a week since he first arrived at Walter Reed uh, Medical Center last Monday, New Year's Day. Uh, but we don't know much beyond that other than the fact that he has resumed his duties as Secretary of Defense. He resumed them Friday night, according to the press secretary from the Pentagon. Now, we've learned some, frankly, head-scratching new details about this over the weekend. About 5 p.m. Friday night, we got a, a very simple statement out of the Pentagon saying that he had been hospitalized all week. For the record, Savannah, we were told that he had been on leave all week. The Pentagon press corps was. In fact, he had been hospitalized. And as we dug into this, we found he had been in the intensive care unit, ICU, for most of the week. That, in fact, um, the White House was not notified of this until Thursday. So, as you said, three days 
after he was hospitalized. And in fact, Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks, who was told on Tuesday to assume some of the duties of the Secretary of Defense, she wasn't even notified why she was assuming those duties until Thursday that he was hospitalized. And just to give a sense of the urgency of the situation, as soon as she found out he was hospitalized, she started making plans to return from vacation. She was in Puerto Rico wow. at the time, all last week, but was told, well, he's about to, he's, he's getting better. He's going to re retake his duties probably in the next hours or so. So she didn't leave her vacation. But that just shows the urgency of this situation. Now, Secretary of Defense Austin did release a statement over the weekend taking responsibility for not disclosing this information publicly or to the media. He wrote in this statement um, that I could have done a better job ensuring the public was appropriately uh, informed. I commit to doing better, but it's important to say this was my medical procedure. I take full responsibility for my decisions about disclosure. What's important to point out there, Savannah, he is specifically saying he takes responsibility for not informing the public. We still don't really have a good ex uh, reason for why the administration, mm. the Pentagon, did not notify the White House for three days. So, yeah, let's bring in Monica now following the release of the defense secretary's statement. President President Biden did speak with him on the phone. What do we know about that conversation? What are we hearing from the White House? Well, we understand that the conversation between the president and Secretary Austin was, quote, warm. We know that at this point, President Biden, according to officials, has full confidence, he says, in his defense secretary. But as Courtney just laid out there, there are still so many puzzling questions here as to why this happened the way that it happened. But we do know that at this point, the White House is saying essentially they were left in the dark, that it wasn't until Thursday that National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan then informed the president because that is when and he got word himself that this was the situation and he passed that along. So we will be sure to press today for a lot more answers on this. This is something that really isn't typical. When you see this kind of level of hospitalization, the ICU, those kinds of details, especially at somebody at that level, when there is so much happening around the world, this is something that certainly the White House and the Pentagon are going to have to continue to provide some answers for in terms of accountability and transparency, Joe and Savannah. Monica, is there any anticipation that there'll be any consequences for this being kept a secret? We haven't gotten any indication of that, but I think as we are going to learn more and uncover more here, there's the potential here for that, and certainly for someone to probably concede here that mistakes were made and that this could have been improved. But Secretary Blinken, who's been traveling in the Middle East for the last couple of days, was asked about this specifically in terms of what his consideration was and whether he would do the same if it was his position. He said he didn't want to get into hypotheticals, but that his full support was behind Secretary Austin as well. Take a listen to how he answered. It's been a highlight of my service to be able to serve alongside him, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing him fully uh, recovered and um, working side by side uh, in the year ahead. What, um, what, is, what is your policy? Uh, again, I think he, he put out a statement uh, addressing this. I'll let that statement speak for itself. And that was Secretary Blinken answering questions from our own Andrea Mitchell, who is traveling with him abroad. And again, I think the White House will be pressed for a lot more, as well as the Pentagon by Courtney, I'm sure. Today. Yeah, and Courtney, I mean, where Secretary Blinken is, is a reminder, there's a lot happening in the Middle East right now. The U.S. is considering strikes against Houthi militants in response to their attacks on ships in the Red Sea. So real quickly, how does Austin's health impact any decisions about what's happening overseas? So the reality is there's redundancy built in here, right? So um, as, as far as specifically the issue with the Houthis, the, the options for any potential strike or targeting of the Houthis, those have been out there. Uh, that's a matter of the, the, that President Biden would have to approve that and order those sorts of strikes. So, But if Secretary Austin, as I said, he's still in the hospital today, it, it's more difficult for him to be a part of those conversations. He can go via, via video teleconference. He can speak to them. But the reality is they can still conduct the business of the U.S. military without Secretary Austin being directly involved. There's, as I said, there's redundancy. But why this is so critical, Joe, is because he is part of the nuclear chain of command. Now, what that means is by law, he has to, the, the National Military Command Center, the NSC, the heads of the national security apparatus, 
apparatus for this country have to be aware of his whereabouts and be able to get him at a moment's notice in case we're in a situation where, heaven forbid, there's a nuclear attack against the United States and there needs to be an immediate response by the chain of command here. He is part of that. That's why this is, is raising so many alarm bells that, in fact, the White House, the senior levels of this administration, simply didn't know where he was for three days. All right, Courtney and Monica, thank you both very much. We are tracking the next major cross-country storm system. That's right, after a weekend of extreme weather, more alerts for flooding rains, damaging winds, heavy snow. Those are all in place for millions. Well, for more on how it could affect you and your area, let's get a check at your morning news now. Weather with meteorologist Michelle Grossman. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Great to see you. And this is a big one. We are looking at major impacts for most of us over the next three days. And that's one of two storms that we're going to see this week. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for the first storm, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday for the second storm. We're already starting to see this storm bring some thunderstorms to portions of the southern plains. We're concerned about nighttime tornadoes in the Gulf Coast states. So if you're in places like Houston, New Orleans, Mobile, you need to have your tornado plan in place because we are looking at volatile conditions later on tonight. We're looking at the chance for really heavy rain in spots, flooding rains, and looking at the chance for blizzard-like conditions in the plains. So we kind of have it all, many of us looking at the chance for damaging winds as well as we go throughout uh, today. Now, as we go through uh, the rest of the week, we're looking at that second storm system. So I think that we might be on weather aid, just making sure that we are on weather aid because that's what I'm using over here. But you can see that blue on the map. That's where we're seeing that heavy snow falling. We're also looking at the rain falling where you're seeing those thunderstorms. Uh, storm alerts, we're looking at so many, millions of us under storm alerts. 108 million under wind alerts, 42 million under winter alerts, and 58 million under flood alerts. We're thinking about flooding, river flooding, and also the chance of flash flooding, especially in portions of the Northeast. We're already so saturated from storms that we've had, the weekend storms, and then storms that we're going to have Tuesday into Wednesday. We're also looking at that other storm bringing uh, more storms later on this week. So flash flood outlook today, we're looking at chances in the south central states, the Gulf Coast states, portions of the southeast by tomorrow. And then into Tuesday, Wednesday, we're looking at the mid-Atlantic into the northeast. So this is what this storm looks like. It's a big one. It's going to bring major impacts. So blizzard-like conditions across the plains today. Look at all those bright colors in the south central states, the Tennessee Valley, the lower Mississippi Valley. That's the anticipation of really heavy rain and also the anticipation of severe weather along the Gulf Coast states. So keep that in mind. And then, guys, by tomorrow, we're looking at the heaviest snow into the Great Lakes and really heavy rain into the mid-Atlantic and also the northeast. So I can't emphasize this enough. We have some really um, heavy burbage coming out of Mobile, the National Weather Service, where we're looking at the chance for really strong storms mm -hmm. later on tonight. Back All to right. you. Thank you, Michelle. Everybody stay safe. We'll see you sure. soon. Turning now to winter illnesses, doctors are warning both COVID cases and flu cases are on the rise in the U.S., and they don't really think there's a peak in sight anytime soon. The CDC says flu levels are high or very high in at least 38 states, and COVID hospitalization rates are up 20% as of Friday. NBC News medical fellow Dr. Akshay Sayal joins us now for more on this. Hi, doctor. Always great to have you with us. So tell us, walk us through, are cases looking different than in years prior, how and how concerning is that? So guys, we talked to four different doctors in different corners of the country and they're telling us this season, this respiratory season is actually a bit unusual. Mm. Um, so what we saw last year, we talked a lot about this triple demic, right? Each virus, the flu, COVID and RSV. But what we saw last year was that, you know, RSV and flu were high initially. Uh, but by the time COVID came, the other two went away. Um, so COVID was kind of here on its own, but what we're seeing this year, guys, is both COVID and flu are sort of neck and neck. They're both kind of hovering at this moderately to, to very high level right now. And that's actually war worrying doctors. What does that mean? Could we, could we see people get sick at the same time with both? Could we see back-to-back -back infections? We've talked a lot about this lingering cough people seem to have. Um, so definitely an unusual respiratory season this year, guys. Are we at risk of being sicker if we get them around the same time? What are some of the ramifications? Of so, this? yeah, we wanted to ask, can you get both flu and COVID or even RSV? Can you get co-infected? Can you get all of these right. at the same time? The CDC is actually tracking this, guys, and it's about 3% of people. So not a very large risk. Uh, but 3% of people will test positive for both of these things at the same time. And you can see here on the, on the screen, there's a lot of symptom overlap between the two, aches and difficulty breathing, fatigue, fever. Really, the only way to tell the difference, guys, is to take a test. 
But to answer your question, Joe, if you do get sick with both, if you are one of those 3%, there is a likelihood you will get more sick. You will be more likely to end up with worse outcomes, as you would expect if you get two viruses. Quickly, before we let you go, is it too late? Should we be getting a flu shot, an uh, updated vaccine? Give us the guidance there. Absolutely not too late. And I think we have a, a map of the flu states here where you can see some are very high, some are not that high yet. And you don't want to wait. See, guys, on the screen here, purple is bad. You do not want to wait for your state to get to the purple. The flu mm. shot takes one to two weeks to work. Absolutely not too late, too late to get it. No matter where you are on that map, you should go out and get it if you haven't. And I've heard from far too many people recently who like are not feeling well, they test negative for COVID, and then they go to work or they go hang out with friends. And <laughs> That's it's like, a really good point. it's happening think, a lot. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't yeah. do that, right? Just I mean, stay home. Yeah. I think sick. we got so used to just being like, is it COVID or is yeah. it not? And then right. I'm off the hook. Yeah. All right. Dr. Sahel, <laughs> always great to see you. Thank you. Anytime. All right, we've got one week to go now until the Iowa caucuses, and Republican presidential contenders are making one last push to win votes throughout the Hawkeye states. With former President Trump the overwhelming favorite among likely Republican voters in Iowa, his GOP rivals are hoping for an early upset. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, as well as former Ambassador Nikki Haley, continue to fight for second place. For the latest, we're joined now by NBC News political correspondent Ali Vitale in Sioux City, Iowa. We're also joined by NBC News senior national politics reporter Jonathan Allen. Good to have have both of you with us. So, Allie, let's start with you. Just what's the feeling on the ground in Iowa, a position they know well in Iowa as we head into this home stretch? Well, the feeling other than cold, obviously, guys, is that this is the home stretch of the race. But what's so striking for those of us like John and I who have covered so many of these caucuses before is typically it feels like there's almost an anyone can take it vibe on the ground. Instead, what we're seeing here is even people who say they don't support Trump are under the assumption that he is going to be the winner here and likely not just the winner, but someone who's able to trounce his rivals in the process. Nevertheless, those rivals are trying to make as many gains as they possibly can. For someone like Ron DeSantis, a second place finish is really the best that he could hope for. But certainly that falls short of the metric he himself had laid at the very beginning of this process, saying that Iowa was going to be the starting bell for him and, frankly, the new wave of Republicanism that he wanted to usher into this party. The other person who's hoping for a strong second place finish for different reasons is former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. She's not expected to win here. She spent less time on the ground here physically holding events than many of her counterparts. But that national momentum that we've seen her riding in places like New Hampshire, she's hoping that Iowa can provide a sort of second place springboard into the Granite State where she is believed by many to be at least carrying some momentum. Whether or not that brings her within striking distance of Trump remains to be seen. But certainly it's all about making momentum start and then, of course, carrying it through to the rest of these early states out of Iowa, guys. John, let's bring you in here. And Ali, by the way, before I talk to John, thank you very much for standing out in the snow for us. Um, uh, John, Trump may have <laughs> got it, girl. this big lead in Iowa, but there are these legal issues, of course, that we, we've been talking about alongside that. With such a big lead in the polls, is the former president viewing this as just a formality? What's he saying heading into this final week before the caucuses, especially since we haven't seen all that much from him actually in Iowa? Yeah, well, he was in Iowa uh, just this weekend. Uh, he gave uh, a couple of speeches to, at uh, commit to caucus rallies. Uh, basically, we were trying to get people to, to you know, sign up and uh, in, uh, in 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 ink, if not in blood, to show up for you. Um, look, his argument uh, to to the public is that uh, you know Democrats are going after him uh, because they are afraid of him. His argument is that uh, he uh, will be able to come in uh, for a second term. Uh, and implement the parts of his agenda that he didn't before. He's got a whole new uh, plan for a second term. So, um, you know, he's he has not been in Iowa as much as some of the other candidates, but he is certainly making his presence felt here in the stretch run. Um, you know, I would categorize it under the, uh, uh, you know, the, the category of uh, not taking anything for granted, um, as Ali reported from Iowa in that beautiful uh, winter wonderland there, mm -hmm. um, you know, Basically, the Iowa electorate is not going to get this. Not going to pick somebody else. Um, you know, you'd have to have some sort of earthquake yeah. uh, between now and the caucuses for that to happen. But um, Trump is not going to be seen as taking it for granted. Yeah, John, I mean, the other Republicans have been reluctant to attack Trump or go after him in any way. Are they doing anything different to try and close the gap here? Yeah, there's a reason that they're not going after him, and it uh, speaks to the tr trouble that they've had moving forward, which is that the vast majority of Republicans 
still like Donald Trump. Even some, a lot of the ones who uh, don't plan to vote for him like Donald Trump. They approve of Donald Trump. And so uh, what these candidates have had difficulty doing, uh, and really it's been impossible so far, is to make the case to Republican voters uh, that they should move away from Donald Trump, which is the first part of a two-part strategy for winning this race, get them to get off of Donald Trump and then get them to like you. Um, but what they, they all skipped that first part, uh, I think partially because they understood that it would backfire to start attacking Trump. We're starting to see a little bit more of that uh, right in this stretch run before Iowa, but uh, arguably too little too late. Mm. Before we let y'all go, Ali, I want to go back to something that you mentioned a moment ago about Nikki Haley. So she has been on the rise, but she made those waves when she made that yeah. comment that New Hampshire corrects what Iowa chooses. You, you mentioned that there is support, it seems, for her in the Granite State, maybe more so than in Iowa as we look ahead to the week after the caucus. But it, 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 walk us through that signaling sort of, is that low expectations for her in Iowa? And is there anything that could look like a win of any sort for her here? Haley's own top surrogate, the New Hampshire governor, Chris Sununu, has actually been on the road in Iowa with her, but has said a few times now that in Iowa, it's generally expected that Trump is going to win here. So even her own top surrogates who want her to be the victor are saying that here in Iowa, it's not going to happen. Yes, we're all playing an expectation setting game when we talk to our sources and they try to tell us where they think they're going to finish. But you also just have to listen to the candidates on the stump. They think that they might have some momentum them, but again, this entire race has really been based around the idea that the guy out in front is so far out there that he doesn't even feel like he has to spend a ton of time on the ground and everyone else is scrambling for second. That's nibbling around the edges. That's not getting the cookie to carry the metaphor. <laughs> All right. Allie and John, thank you both. We'll talk to you often over the next week and really over sure. the next 10 months. All right. Much more to come here on Morning News now. Later this hour, feeling golden. That's right. The Golden Globes kicking off the award season, honoring the best in team. TV and movies. We're going to tell you who came out on top. But first, a miraculous rescue in Japan. A 90-year-old woman pulled from the rubble more than five days after a massive earthquake. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back this morning. Congressional leaders are one step closer to reaching a deal to avoid a partial government shutdown later this month. That's right. On Sunday, House Speaker Mike Johnson and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer announced the details of a top line spending agreement, which is a significant step toward avoiding a shutdown. The deal establishes an overall spending level of nearly $1.6 trillion in the 2024 fiscal year. NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Sirkin joins us now with the latest developments. Julie, good morning. So what's in this deal and what happens next year? Well, first and foremost, guys, good morning. About $886 billion for defense, $772 for non-defense discretionary spending. That's how this top line number is broken down. And this was an agreement, as you mentioned, reached by the Republican House Speaker Mike Johnson and the Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. This is something that largely staff in the room, aides have been involved in hashing out. You see how that money uh, is broken down on your screen there, but this really is just the first step here, guys. And we're uh, under two weeks away from one of those first of two shutdown deadlines on January 19th. This agreement, while very important, basically instructs appropriators to now go into a room and decide how to allocate all of these funds between all of the government agencies half of which run out of money uh, on January 19th. So certainly an important first step. Uh, appropriators have a lot of work ahead of them to figure out how to make this happen, to write the bills, to agree on the numbers uh, in time for the House and Senate to pass. But the clock is certainly ticking. Julie, the deal is an important step to avoiding a government shutdown. But, I mean, the threat of that is certainly not over. We've already seen some conservative pushback to the deal in the House. I think we have a full screen here. We're going to pull up for our viewers. The House Freedom Caucus called this agreement a, quote, total failure, as you can see here. What are you hearing on the Hill? Yeah, this is something that I expect Johnson is not certainly shocked or surprised by. The agreement here largely matches the one reached by then ousted House Speaker Kevin McCarthy back in the spring with President Biden. Johnson did get a couple of concessions he could point to. For example, they would expedite those cuts to the IRS, something Democrats have strongly pushed back on and are pushing back when it comes to this deal. He also uh, got those unused COVID uh, funds absolved in, absorbed into this deal, rather. So Johnson can point to some of that to kind of make those House Freedom Caucus members, those hard right uh, members of his party, uh, more inclined to support this deal. But as you see in their statements, 
they're pretty upset about it. And this is important for Johnson to watch because he is uh, balancing a two to three seat majority. He doesn't have a lot of votes he can use. And almost certainly it's clear that he's going to need Democrats to vote for this if he wants to avoid shutdown. Julie, I also want to ask you about comments at House Republican Conference Chair Elise Stefanik made yesterday on Meet the Press, making news after she was asked if she would commit to certifying the 2024 presidential election vote. Let's listen to what she had to say. We'll talk about it on the other side. But just to be very clear, I don't hear you committed to certifying the election results. Will you only commit to certify the results? If, if former they're President Trump wins? If they, Does that mean if former President Trump no, wins? No, it means if they are constitutional. Real quick, is this a sentiment widely shared among House Republicans? Well, remember, Stefanik was one of 147 Republicans uh, who voted back in 2021 in January uh, not to certify the election results from multiple states. So this is a wide majority of the Republican conference in the House. This isn't Stefanik alone in her opinions, but certainly it is uh, significant. It is stunning that she refused uh, to say now, to preemptively um, say that she could potentially uh, not certify the election results in 2024. Uh, and it matches what other Republicans have been saying in the House. It certainly is a different position among Republicans in the Senate. Even allies of the former presidents there, like Lindsey Graham, for example, told our Kristen Welker just weeks ago that it's time for the president to look forward, not back, and not talk about the election issue, not rehash this. Uh, but certainly it is not surprising that Stefanik, one of the former president's key allies in the House, is taking this position. And it's one that many Republicans in the House are going to continue to push as well. That's a question that's going to be asked a lot in the coming months. All right, Julie, thank you so much. Let's turn now to the situation at the border. Under fire from Republican Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas will visit Eagle Pass, Texas later today. It's part of a trip to discuss border enforcement efforts as lawmakers in Washington work to reach a deal on immigration and border policy. For more on this, we are joined by NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley. Hey, Julia, so what can you tell us about this visit? What's on the agenda? Well, we know that Secretary Mayorkas will be traveling with the acting secretary of CBP, Troy Miller. They're going to Eagle Pass, where they'll meet with members of Customs and Border Protection, as well as local officials. Now, why Eagle Pass? Because just a few weeks ago, Eagle Pass was one of two epicenters of a migrant surge, a record migrant surge in December. They were seeing thousands cross in that very small area every day. Now those numbers have really backed off, though, but it's still worth him talking to the agents who are involved, how they were able to process people, and talk to local officials who oftentimes have said they haven't gotten enough help from the federal government. So as Congress returns this week, we know border negotiations are front and center. On Sunday, Republican Senator James Langford, Langford said a deal on immigration and border policy could be reached this week. What more do we know about the progress there? Well, Lankford is one of three key negotiators. Another one independent, Kristen Cinema, said last week they were closing in. So now we're trying to read tea leaves like that. Mayorkas is also someone to ask about this because and we will ask him this today when he's down there and has a press conference later. He's been in the room for a lot of these meetings because as they've hashed out what each policy could look like, whether or not they're going to mandate the detention of all migrants, allow immigrants who are living in the country to be uh, deported without a trial, uh, all all of these things, if that is something that Mayorkas weighs in on, whether or not it's possible, the logistics, the manpower, what this looks like. And so, frankly, he's very close to these negotiations, although I'm sure he'll stay quite pretty close uh, lipped on a lot of the details. And it's something also to watch just in terms of what the Biden administration is doing on this. They've really wanted all of these negotiations to play out behind closed doors between Republicans and Democrats in the Senate. And then they want to wait until there's a real deal, one that can actually pass the House, before they weigh in on whether or not they would back it. So it's been a really tricky dance for them to walk. Possibly they're getting closer. We'll have to keep watching. Julia, quickly before we let you go, this visit comes after we had seen these record numbers in December of migrants at the border, but now somewhat of a drop in illegal border crossings after Mexico increased enforcement efforts. What's going on there? Well, they did increase enforcement efforts because they had lessened those enforcement efforts at the end of last year when they started to run out of money because of the record surge. We have new reporting out on NBCNews.com this morning that talks about negotiations that are ongoing between Mexico and the U.S., where the U.S. wants Mexico to do more to continue to interdict migrants, to poor people who they see within their country who are U.S.-bound, and also uh, to try to do more um, to 
to basically keep that U.S. bound traffic from getting here. But Mexico has a lot of leverage because they see them as they see themselves as a country caught in the middle of this problem as migrants from countries like Venezuela are on their way to the United States. And just last week, President of Mexico asked for extreme things from the U.S., like granting vi visas to 10 million Hispanics living in the U.S. and ending sanctions on Venezuela, all things we could probably bet that the Biden administration will not do. Mm. But it really shows just how much Mexico has in terms of leverage going into these negotiations and how dependent the U.S. is to get Mexico to right. do more because of those record numbers. All right, Julia Ainsley, thank you very much. Let's get some international headlines. An incredible survival story out of Japan where a woman in her 90s was pulled from the rubble five days after a massive earthquake. Truly incredible. Megan Fitzgerald joins us now from London with that and more. Hey, Megan, good morning. Guys, good morning. You're right. Absolutely incredible. Starting today out of Japan, where that elderly woman in her 90s, as you mentioned, was pulled from the debris of her collapsed home and she was alive. I mean, and, and as you said, you've got context to this. We're talking more than 120 hours, which is more than five days this woman was underneath there and she was pulled out. Of course, all of this coming after that massive quake that hit on Monday uh, with a series of other quakes that followed. Now, keep in mind, chances of survival dwindle after the first 72 hours so this really is remarkable there have been several other rescues as first responders and soldiers work to try and save lives more than 160 people have died in japan since last monday meanwhile the so-called post office scandal here in the uk is back in the spotlight thanks to a tv series that's airing it in the country the metropolitan police are continuing to investigate potential fraud this is all related to this year's long this year's long scandal where the post office itself wrong Thankfully convicted its own employees because of faulty software. So now police are investigating the software and the company. Software showed dis uh, discrepancies in the finances of the post office, which resulted in hundreds of employees being wrongfully accused. And guys, you know we love baby animals, so we got another one for you. The Prague Zoo is now home to a baby gorilla. Her mother gave birth last Tuesday, and we're seeing video of the baby sleeping on her mom. Super cute, super, super cute, but this is also a big deal because uh, the gorillas were deemed uh, an endangered species in 2016, so this, of course, is an effort to try and save them. Aww. Guys, love to see that. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Thanks for the cute animal. Coming up from the TV and movie screen to the red carpet. When we come back, we're going to tell you who won big at last night's Golden Globes and how it could all set the stage for the rest of this award season. You're watching Morning News now. Welcome back. It is the start of January, which can only mean one thing. Award season is here. And the Golden Globes kicked off the season last night, honoring some of the most iconic names of both the silver screen as well as the television screen. Fandango Managing Editor Eric Davis joins us to recap last night's biggest moments. Eric, good to have you with us. So let's start with movies. We know the summer was dominated by Barbenheimer, Oppenheimer and Barbie. Seems like we saw the same thing last night, right? Yeah, if this was Barbenheimer round one. Well, round one went to Oppenheimer. It led all films with five big wins last night, including Best Picture Drama. Christopher Nolan also won for Director. Killian Murphy, Robert Downey Jr. winning acting awards. For Barbie, it won two awards. Billie Eilish won for her song, What Was I Made For? The film itself won the first ever box office and cinematic achievement award. However, Barbie did lose best comedy musical to Poor Things, uh, and that its star Emma Stone also won for best actress. Paul Giamatti, Divine Joy Randolph, Lily Gladstone also winning acting awards. And what about, let's talk TV, who snagged the top awards there? Anything that really stood out to you? Well, yes, you know, with the exception of Elizabeth Debicki winning for Best Supporting Actress for The Crown, this was really a night that belonged to three shows. Succession won big, it won Best Show, Drama, Kieran Culkin, Matthew McFadden, Sarah Snook winning acting awards. My personal favorite show, The Bear, that I love that mm -hmm. show. That won Best Comedy Series. Also, Jeremy Allen White, Iowa Dibri winning acting awards. And then the limited series Beef. This was a big fan favorite. It's on Netflix. That won limited series. Stephen Yoon, Alan Wa Wa Ali Wong winning acting awards. 
Beef is amazing if you haven't seen it yet. It's just it's very intense. Just be prepared. <laughs> the bear I love, but I haven't seen beef and it made me excited. I'm like, oh, good. Exactly. You, you mentioned Lily Gladstone, Killers of the Flower Moon winning Best Actress last night, making history, also making history, the Japanese animated film, The Boy and the Heron. Why are some of these wins so important? And were there any others that may have been missed? Yeah, I love the Lily Gladstone win. You know, she becomes the first indigenous person to win this award. It's her first time nominated, her first ever win uh, at the Golden Globes. And this is an actress who's sandwiched between Leonardo DiCaprio and Robert De Niro in Martin Scorsese's film. <laughs> and she is the one who is the big winner. I think it's a great story. Also, The Boy in the Heron becomes the first Japanese animated film to ever win in this category. Also the first win for the famed Studio Ghibli. Uh, and Hayao Miyazaki, this is his first win as well. Uh, big surprise in that category. I think a lot of people mm. thought Spider-Man was going to take it, but it did not. Lily's speech, by the way, one of my favorites of the night for sure. Um, before you go, let's talk about the host, Joe Coy. Uh, I'm not sure how much people loved it, receiving some commentaries and backlash this morning. Tell us why. Yeah, I think it's definitely divisive, you know. And you, that's what you always get with a stand-up comedian. He actually pointed out multiple times that he only had 10 days to prepare for this job. Um, I mean, you always kind of get this. Ricky Gervais got this uh, for many years. He was always roasted online for his jokes. Ironically, Gervais won for best stand-up uh, show <laughs> last night. But you know what? The show made up for it with some of its presenters, Will Ferrell, Kristen Wiig, very so memorable good. in their presenting. Yeah, I think that a lot of people saying, oh, why weren't they hosting? Yeah. But it's hard to get people to commit to the full hosting duties. Yeah, that's, true. <laughs> that's a big that responsibility. That was one of the best moments, though, and I also <laughs> love Ray Romano. Eric Davis, thank you very much. Good to see you. Coming up, ever wonder what happens to all of your holiday returns? Well, it turns out some stores and shoppers are cashing in on those unwanted gifts. We're going to explain how up next on Morning News Now. We are back with some financial headlines for you and a tentative new deal for auto workers in Indiana. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, so the UAW strikes a tentative contract deal with auto parts maker Allison Transmission, and this covers 1,500 workers in Indiana. Now, the agreement guarantees union members a starting wage of $20 an hour and retroactive pay hikes. Workers rejected an earlier offer from Allison. Their demands follow a larger pattern by unions to press companies for better wages, benefits, and working conditions. Allison makes automatic transmissions for medium and heavy-duty commercial vehicles, such as buses and military vehicles. iPhone owners who filed claims in Apple's $500 million um, class action settlement over the company's decision to slow down the performance of phones with older batteries, well, they're starting to get their checks. Apple agreed to settle the 2017 lawsuit, which alleged it didn't properly disclose what it was doing. Mac Rumors reports some customers have seen money deposited to their accounts in the amount of $92. The affected devices were the iPhone 6, 7, and the original SE. And speaking of Apple, Apple may drop an official announcement on the Vision Pro Mixed Reality headset this week or next, and it's conveniently timed with the Consumer Electronics Show, which Apple never attends. Bloomberg reports the headset has already begun shipping to U.S. warehouses on a small scale and is expected to arrive in stores as soon as next month. Meetings have been scheduled for employees at Apple retail stores across the country next week with training sessions planned for the final week of January, guys. Hmm. Be interesting to see if it changes the kind of yeah. VR drought, I feel, at all. We'll see, yeah. yeah. Metaverse interest. All right, Silvana, thank mm -hmm. you. Now to the secret world of retail returns. NBC News business and data correspondent Brian Chung gives us an inside look at how companies and shoppers are cashing in and shows us the surprising places some of those holiday gifts you sent back really end up. If you remember returning this grill, these mouse ears, or this holiday lawn flamingo, you might be surprised to find that holiday gift you just didn't want. Well, it didn't go back on the shelf. It comes to places like this, where tens of thousands of items a day will come in, returns that will be someone else's discounted treasure. 
So how big is this facility? This building is just over 100,000 square feet and has about 10,000 items coming in every day. And Jeff Rexigal is the general manager of Liquidity Services, part of a growing industry of companies that have made a business off of returns with a boost from the holidays. Americans spent nearly a trillion dollars this holiday season and will likely return 15% of that, more than $140 billion worth of stuff. For retailers, checking returns, then putting them back on the shelves takes time, costs money, and requires more staff. There's also an unboxing that has to happen. If a retailer is online only, there's a, a warehousing aspect. So instead, companies like Jeff's take the stuff off their hands and then turn around and sell it. And they're busier than ever. Sometimes we will do this as a service to retailers, and sometimes we'll just buy this inventory from them directly. Each day, bringing literal truckloads of surprises. So what's coming off the truck? You don't know what's in there. Sometimes. Could be anything <laughs> under the sun. Step one, sort through all of those returned items. We're walking by pallets of mostly returns. And again, this is any kind of product. We see furniture, we see uh, home items, we see kid pools. Step two, inventory the items and check the quality. Then a quick photo for listing online where buyers bid. You win the auction, then you come and pick up your items. So you come here once a week about? About once a week. Wow. Stacy Adam buys home products at 80 to 90% off then resells them on Facebook. It's kind of like treasure hunting, right? It is. It's like Christmas every time. Giving returns a second life is a win-win. Shoppers save big, and that unwanted stuff doesn't end up in a landfill. Consumers really want great deals, and then they want product that they feel good about buying. Although, once taken off the lot, all sales are final. No returns. Brian Chung, NBC News, Pittston, Pennsylvania. That makes sense, and I want in I was saying, a fun place. place to go shopping right For there. For sure. All right, coming up, we're going to Grandma's house. Up next, we're going to tell you about one family slumber party tradition that has become a new trend. You're watching Morning News now. Elvis is returning to the stage in a new virtual reality show. The King of Rock and Roll will star in Elvis Evolution, which will debut in November in London before coming, of course, to Las Vegas. The show is an interactive experience where visitors can walk through scenes of Elvis's life story, ending with an intimate performance by an Elvis holograph. Andrew McGinnis, the founder of the company Layered Reality, says he wants visitors to feel like they're stepping back in time to Memphis in 1958. His team used thousands of hours of live footage provided by the Elvis estate to put the attraction together with the help of AI. It follows a virtual ABBA show, which has been a huge success. So, These are just so cool, as we out. keep seeing them. It's like kind of scary, but awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Yeah, but Joe. as long as like the Elvis estate is enough, Totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah cool. absolutely. Yeah. Well, finally this hour, we're taking a look at a heartwarming trend that could bring you right back to your childhood. So right before Christmas, a couple in Ohio was surprised by their adult grandchildren showing up for a sleepover. Well, now their family tradition is catching on. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has the story. Hi. Well, hi there. How is this for a surprise? We can have a sleepover. <laughs> you can have a sleepover. Yeah. Karen and Wayne Gamble in Ohio had no idea their grown-up grandkids would be showing up at the door. <laughs> one by one, all seven of them from across the country, after weeks secretly planning this surprise sleepover. Look, our favorite people in the world. It's part of a wholesome trend that's catching on. Adult grandchildren nationwide surprising grandparents with slumber parties from Texas <laughs> to Michigan and back in Ohio well that's great <laughs> are you serious <laughs> well, to be clear you have no idea any of this stuff is going on no absolutely not the cousins plan coming together in a secret group chat, building up to that big night. Jammies, brownies, even Brooke's famous buffalo chicken dip. You don't mind, do you? <laughs> oh my gosh, no! Tori Halen had hustled back from college in South Carolina. 
they are so deserving of our time in every way. What were you thinking when you saw that door open and they just started coming in? I was so confused and so blessed that these seven kids thought so much of us that they wanted to spend another sleepover with us after so many years of doing the same thing with them. Nana, I hear the emotion in your voice. Why? <laughs> because they're so dear to us and they always make time for us and they're the center of our world and they have been for 28 years. That's when this tradition began, when they were just kids sharing snacks, swapping stories and whipping up treats. They really just spoiled us and made us feel so loved. So this is all the plans all along? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The perfect gift. Oh my gosh, this is an unforgettable <laughs> surprise. Oh, now look what you did. I know. <laughs> what does this experience tell us about the power of family? With that night, that they would find the time to share their love with us, that we've come to treasure so much. I just wish everybody could have some of that, what we've had over the years. It's so important, and um, they are priceless to us, just priceless. Okay, that was really sweet. I'm tearing up. It's a great viral trend. What a good idea, oh, right? Oh, so sweet. Swing makes me really miss my grandma, and I totally remember those sleepovers when I was little. It was such a thing. In one cabinet, she had Hershey bars at the level where we could reach them, which was like, we're at grandma's house. Your parents house. would never do. No, they would not. And my mom would be like, that's enough of the sun-kissed orange soda and Hershey bars. But it's so sweet. Thank we, you, Peter Alexander, for we that. We would do endless Yahtzee. <laughs> so Yahtzee, you, uh, Yahtzee and Parcheesi. There you go. Those were our two games with grandma. All right, that's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. But the news continues right now. Stick with us. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this Monday. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, we're watching some extreme weather that's impacting millions of Americans. From the Northeast, now digging out from that major winter storm over the weekend, to the South, where some equally wicked weather produced this apparent tornado in Fort Lauderdale. We're covering it all, plus the next chance for severe storms now brewing over the Great Plains. We're counting down to Iowa this morning, the state's crucial caucuses just one week away. But can the dwindling pool of 2024 GOP contenders catch up to the front runner, former President Donald Trump? We've got the state of play in just a moment. Also this morning, new developments in that mid-air scare from over the weekend. A door panel blew out in the middle of an Alaska Airlines flight. The important discovery of where exactly that panel was found and the uncertain future of one of Boeing's most popular jets. And we're taking you to Hollywood this morning with a full recap of the history-making Golden Globes. Another night of Barbenheimer with I both know. movies doing quite there well. You know. And the kickoff to award season, right? Exactly. But we get Emmys, Grammys, Oscars. So we get it all in a short period of time. And so. by the way, we're about to get into this, but you know what else we got this weekend? Snow. Snow. <laughs> Though it didn't last long here no, in New it York, but it lasted a long time for a lot of people. It's where we're going to begin this hour. A lot of folks are digging out after that winter, after that weekend winter storm. Yeah, that's right. The storm brought heavy snow and freezing rain throughout the Northeast. Several places saw more than a foot of snow fall over the last several days. Another storm this week is brewing. It's expected to bring flooding rain and damaging winds. Meteorologist Michelle Grossman will let us know what you can expect in just a moment. But first, we're going to check in with NBC News correspondent Kathy Park, who joins us now from Worcester, Massachusetts, with the latest look at that snow behind you. Hey, Kathy, good morning. <sighs> Hey guys, good morning. Yeah, the weekend storm had a little bit of everything. Rain, snow, ice here in Worcester. You just have to take a look around. We got a lot of snow, 13 inches. And this morning, that heavy snow and ice still coating these tree limbs. And yes, the storm is out of here, but there's another one right behind it. This morning, millions of Americans waking up to a blast of winter weather. Much in the Northeast digging out from one of the biggest snowstorms in nearly two years. Snow buried portions of Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, some spots reporting over 18 inches. With snow and ice quickly piling up, slick conditions sent cars and even tractor trailers sliding across New England highways. I suggest maintaining your vehicle, put snow tires on it, be prepared. The storm cutting off power to tens of thousands and more extreme weather down south. 
a tornado with 80 mile per hour winds, barreling through Fort Lauderdale Saturday, damaging property and power lines. This year's first winter punch, dangerous for some, but plenty of fun for others. My son was so upset why we didn't get any snow in December, so I told him, here it is. And back here in Worcester, temps dipped into the 20s, so icing is an issue this morning, but a big change is coming in the next 24 hours. Rain is in the forecast, several inches of rain, so that could lead to rapid snow melt, especially with large snow piles like this one, wow. and also heighten the risk for those flash floods. Hey, Savannah Kathy, Joe. we appreciate you being out there for us. Stay warm, thanks. All right, let's get more on the major winter storm with your morning news now, weather. That's right, time for Michelle Grossman to join us again. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hey there, guys. Good morning. And this is a big one. We are looking at looking at major impacts across the country. We're looking at wind damage, also heavy, heavy snow in some spots, blizzard-like conditions throughout the plains. As Kathy mentioned, we're looking at the chance for flooding, some flash flooding. That's due to the rain falling and also snow melt. And then we're also looking at the chance for severe storms later on tonight. So let's get to it because we're looking at many under storm alerts, 108 million under wind alerts, 42 million under winter alerts, and 58 million under flood alerts. This is going to be a big story over the next three days. You need to be prepared to clean out your gutters if you are expecting that rain. If you're in the Gulf Coast states, you're looking at the chance for severe storms, and that would include the overnight hours. So you need to have your tornado plan in place if you're in places like Mobile, New Orleans, also in uh, Pensacola. So we're looking at a multi-threat system today, blizzard-like conditions throughout the plains, severe weather along the Gulf Coast states that starts this evening into the overnight hours. Then tomorrow, look what happens. All that rain into the Carolinas, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast. We are already so saturated. We're going to add rain on top of that. So we're concerned about river flooding, stream flooding, creek flooding, also the chance for flash flooding as we're out and about. On the backside of that system, pulling in that colder air. So we're looking at snow in portions of the Great Lakes. This is going to move into the northeast or the portions of New England by Wednesday. So kind of a wall of water. We're going to see snow still in the extreme portions of northern New England. Now let's talk about that severe weather threat because we're looking at 14 million people at risk, especially where you see that orange. That's New Orleans, Mobile, Panama City where we could see some very strong storms. Uh, remember, nocturnal tornadoes are double as dangerous, so you need to, need to have that tornado plan in place. And we're looking at the places where you see that hatched area. Then to, by tomorrow, we're looking at the southeast from Cape Hatteras, Bernal Beach, Savannah, Jacksonville, into Panama City. You guys, 24 million people at risk tomorrow. So this goes on through Wednesday, and then we have another storm system that's going to move through Wednesday mm. through Friday. We're going to keep track of it all for you. Back to you. All right. We know you'll stay on it for us. Thank you so much, Michelle. Well, now to the race for the White House. We're now exactly one week away from the first presidential contest with the Iowa caucuses set for next Monday. Republican presidential hopeful spent the weekend traveling the state looking to drum up support. Former President Trump, though, maintains a large lead in the polls heading into the caucuses, but the other candidates are going to try to cut into that lead. NBC News correspondent Garrett Haig, who covers the Trump campaign, joins us from Des Moines with the latest on the state of the race. Hey, Garrett, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. We had all the major candidates crisscrossing the state this weekend, asking Iowans for their support in a race that, as you point out, Donald Trump is really running away with. And now the rest of the field is running out of time to catch up. This morning, caucus crunch time in Iowa, with the 2024 campaign kicking off one week from today. Hello, Iowa. Happy New Year. Polling shows it's Donald Trump's race to lose. Mr. Trump leading the Hawkeye state by a wide margin, urging his supporters not to be complacent. Pretend you're one point down, okay? You're one point down. You have to get out and you have to vote, vote, vote. You got to do it by big, big margins. The former president downplaying the violence of the January 6th attack on the Capitol on its third anniversary Saturday and calling those convicted of crimes for their actions that day hostages. They ought to release the J6 hostages. They've suffered enough. They ought to release them. Republican Congresswoman Elise Stefanik defending his comments on Meet the Press Sunday. I have concerns about the treatment of January 6 hostages. With more than $100 million spent on TV ads alone in Iowa so far. Let's save our country. The caucus is now shaping up to be a battle for second place between former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, trading barbs on the trail this weekend. Donald Trump is running for his issues. Nikki Haley's running for her donors issues. But every single commercial, God bless him, that Ron DeSantis has put on the air, there's not an ounce of truth. 
the candidates battling over a dwindling pool of undecided voters. I'm excited about DeSantis and Haley. Like homemaker Melissa Nobles, who we met at a DeSantis event. How do you think you'll make that final decision? I think it's going to come down to who's talking about the things that affect me every day. As for Mr. Trump, his next appearance will be pretty far from the traditional campaign trail. He'll be in an appeals court in Washington, D.C. in the election interference case. He argued on social media overnight that he should have immunity from prosecution for any actions he took as president to fight voter fraud, saying that was part of his job, Savannah. All right, Garrett. Hey, kicking off the week into Iowa as well as his own tour of many states as we start this primary season. Garrett, thank you very much. <laughs> To Hollywood we go, awards season officially underway with celebrities hitting the red carpet for the Golden Globes, with honored, which honored movie moguls and television titans alike. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung has a recap of last night's celebration. Kaylee, good morning. Yeah, guys, good morning. Last night was a celebration Hollywood has been waiting for, and it was just as fabulous as you'd imagine. There were historic firsts, a pair of new awards, and all the star power we could handle. Brie Larson told us she had to catch her breath after meeting J-Lo. It was a girls' night for the cast of Barbie, and none other than Taylor Swift made the whole place shimmer. Oppenheimer! Oppenheimer blasting the Golden Globes competition, leading the night with five wins, including Best Picture Drama, Best Director, Best Actor, and Best Supporting Actor for Robert Downey Jr. To my fellow nominees, let's not pretend this is a compliment. This is a first time. This is more of a most improved player thing. The stars shined for the first major award show since the actors and writers strikes shut down Hollywood. What I'm so glad is that the strike ended and we all got to be here and that we can celebrate. First time host Joe Coy poking fun at nominee Taylor Swift, who did not seem amused. Uh, the big difference between the Golden Globes and the NFL, on the Golden Globes, we have fewer camera shots of Taylor Swift. I swear, there's just more to go to. Here. The Globes refresh brought new categories, like the award for cinematic and box office achievement, which was boxed up by Barbie. Thank you so much to the Golden Globes for creating an award that celebrates movie fans. Succession's final season dominated the TV categories, winning four Globes, including the show's third for best drama. Succession! Ali Wong became the first Asian woman to win Best Actress in a Limited Series for Beef, while The Bear served up a sweep of its own as the best TV musical or comedy, with stars Jeremy Allen White and Io Adabari both taking home acting globes. But the most emotional moment of the night came with Lily Gladstone's win for her performance in Killers of the Flower Moon, making her the first indigenous person to ever win a globe. This is for... Every little res kid, every little urban kid, every little native kid out there who has a dream, who is seeing themselves represented. That was such a beautiful speech. And you had Oprah and Purple, Margot Robbie and Pink. Those bets were as easy to place as Oppenheimer and Succession sweeping. And it was also a monster night for a surprise breakout film. Poor Things took home the prize for Best Picture, Musical or Comedy, and Emma Stone won her second career globe for her role in that film. Okay. This was just the beginning of the fun and glamour of award season, Joe. Oscar nominations will be announced in two weeks, so yeah. stay tuned. And Emma Stone could be winning her second Oscar this year, too. We'll have to wait and see. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. Appreciate your reporting. Well, now let's get to the investigation into that terrifying ordeal aboard an Alaska Airlines flight Friday from Oregon to Southern California when a panel blew out mid-flight. This morning, NTSB investigators are turning their attention to that door plug that was found in a backyard in Portland, Oregon. They're hoping it will help them figure out exactly what happened. NBC News aviation correspondent Tom Costello joins us now from Reagan National Airport with the latest here. Hey, Tom, good morning. Savannah, this was a, a relatively brand new plane. They had just taken ownership of it in November. The NTSB has now recovered the black boxes. However, the cockpit voice recorder has been overwritten because it only it overwrites after two hours and more time had elapsed than they wanted. So as a result, there's nothing on the CVR that they're going to be able to glean. The NTSB has also interviewed the crew already, being held up as heroes for their courage and their bravery in dealing with this onboard decompression explosion as the plane was flying from Portland, Oregon, down to California. 
This morning, a critical discovery after that very close call in the skies. I'm excited to announce that we found the door plug. The NTSB saying overnight a teacher in Portland contacted investigators after he found the missing piece, a door plug, in his backyard two days after the decompression explosion at 16,000 feet, which twisted and bent nearby seats and sucked the headrests and cushions out of the 737 MAX 9. One teenage boy had his shirt pulled off of him. A sock was found stuck in the plane's frame. One flight attendant suffered a knee injury. The NTSB chief says if it had happened at a cruising altitude, 34,000 feet, it could have been deadly with passengers pulled out of the hole. There could have been some significant consequences for the passengers that were seated in that area of the plug and throughout the cabin, really. As cold wind ripped through the cabin, the force of the explosion pulled the cockpit door open, slamming it against the lavatory. Passengers described terror on board. There was a big uh, boom or a, a mini explosion in the rear of the plane. And my focus in that moment was just breathe into the oxygen mass and um, trust that the flight crew will will do everything they can to keep us safe. It happened behind the plane's left wing, where a hole is cut for an optional emergency exit. But Alaska Airlines didn't need it, so the door was plugged and sealed, leaving an ordinary window. Investigators will look at whether that plug was properly bolted in place during manufacturing. Meanwhile, the FAA has grounded 171 MAX 9s in the U.S., forcing Alaska and United Airlines to cancel hundreds of flights. Yeah, there are a lot of flights still canceled today, Alaska and United Airlines. The NTSB also looking at why it is several pilots crews had reported that in the days before this incident, reported that they had a decompression warning light in the cockpit. Why was the plane allowed to keep flying? Alaska says that they had, in fact, put that on their list of issues they needed to check, that they had told the pilots they could no longer fly that plane over water, can't go to Hawaii until they resolve the decompression question. And then, of course, Friday night, a major decompression compression explosion at 16,000 feet. They were very, very lucky. Back to you. Oh, they really were. So many questions here still, Tom. Thank you so much. Well, we've got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including the very latest out of the Middle East, where Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting with some key leaders across the region this morning after a deadly wave of airstrikes in Gaza over the weekend. But first, after the break, a gun lobby shakeup in the run-up to the start of a corruption trial involving the now former CEO of the NRA. We're going to bring you more on that after this. Welcome back. The National Rifle Association CEO Wayne LaPierre announced his resignation on Friday. According to the NRA, LaPierre cited health reasons for his decision to step down after more than 30 years leading the gun rights lobbying group. It all comes as LaPierre's civil trial begins today in New York City for allegedly violating nonprofit laws and misusing millions of dollars of NRA funding by using them personally. NBC News Justice and Intelligence Correspondent Ken Delaney and joins us now with more on this. So Ken, first of all, take us through this decision. What's the NRA said about LaPierre's decision to step down? And does his resignation tell us anything about any potential legal, legal jeopardy he could face? Good morning, Joe and Savannah. The NRA is saying that Mr. LaPierre cited health reasons for his decision, and they say they're going to vigorously defend themselves against this lawsuit by the New York State Attorney General. But we all know that this is about to be a very embarrassing week for the NRA because the allegations in this lawsuit and against Mr. LaPierre specifically are extraordinary. They accuse him of bilking this organization, this nonprofit corporation, using it as his personal piggy bank. For example, uh, you, using uh, co company-funded private jet trips with his family eight times to the Bahamas in three years for half a million dollars. There is an example of a trip that he made to shop for suits at the Zania Boutique in Beverly Hills, where he charged the organization $40,000. So there's no criminal jeopardy here. This is a civil lawsuit, but they are see uh, the, the attorney general is seeking financial compensation from both the NRA and Mr. LaPierre. When New York Attorney General Letitia James had filed this suit, that was back in 2020, one of its original goals sought to ban LaPierre from leadership roles. What impact do you think his resignation could have on the trial, given that was kind of part of this? 
Yeah, well, clearly, so she's achieved uh, one of her top goals from this lawsuit. And, and what she said in a post on X is that, you know, it, it, this is a vindication of her allegations that Mr. LaPierre is corrupt. But she said th this move, this resignation, will not shield him from accountability. And by that, she means financial accountability. This case is going to go forward. It's going to go through all these sordid details about the finances. And the reason if folks are wondering, why is the attorney general, what right does she have to sue a private organization about how it spends money? It's because it's a nonprofit. It's subsidized by the taxpayers, by you and me. And so it has to spend money reasonably. And the government has a right to regulate and look into how it's spending money. And if it's compensating people too much, if it's sending its leader on private jet trips with his family to the Bahamas, that's an issue for the taxpayers. So, Ken, the civil trial gets underway today. Real quick, what can we expect? Yeah, so there will be opening arguments today and per perhaps some initial testimony. This is expected to be a six to eight week trial. There's going to be a lot of documents, a lot of experts talking about spending, uh, and a lot of really embarrassing and sordid details about how that organization's money was spent, guys. All right, Ken Delaney and Ken, thank you so much. Well, Secretary of State Antony Blinken is continuing his tour of the Middle East this morning, one day after warning the war in Gaza could spread across the region. Secretary Blinken is meeting leaders in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia this morning before heading to Israel later this afternoon. The trip comes after a deadly weekend of Israeli airstrikes in Gaza. NBC News foreign correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Tel Aviv with the latest. Hey, Josh, so we know Blinken kicked off this trip over the weekend. Tell us who he's met with so far and what's come of those talks as well as what we can expect from when he heads to Israel later today. Well, hey, good morning, guys. A big part of the visit so far has been working with U.S. allies in the region like Jordan uh, and Turkey, who may have some influence over Iran to try to get Tehran uh, to get its proxy groups like Hezbollah, the Houthis, and others uh, to avoid escalating with Israel. Now, uh, in his visit to Doha, Qatar, a big focus of that stop uh, was really on trying to get those stalled hostage negotiations back on track. But here in Israel, uh, the secretary is really going to be focused in part uh, on trying to push back on and some far-right Israeli politicians who have suggested that Gazans could be forced to leave the Gaza Strip by the hundreds of thousands. Take a listen. Palestinian civilians must be able to return home as soon as conditions allow. They cannot, they must not be pressed to leave Gaza. We reject the statements by some Israeli ministers and lawmakers calling for a resettlement of Palestinians outside of Gaza. These statements are irresponsible. They're inflammatory. The State Department says Blinken will also be focused on trying to boost humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip, as the U.N. says many of its convoys have been delayed now for days. So, Josh, we understand two Al Jazeera journalists were among those killed in an Israeli airstrike on southern Gaza yesterday. What can you tell us about that, and then how are both Israel and Al Jazeera responding? Yeah, so among those killed in this strike was the son of Wal al Dadu, who is the Al Jazeera bureau chief uh, in the Gaza Strip. He already lost his wife, son, daughter, and other family members earlier in the war. Uh, and Al Jazeera is now calling this a, an assassination. We have reached out to the Israeli military. They are acknowledging there was a strike that they say was aimed at uh, someone who was operating uh, an aircraft, probably a drone, uh, that was dangerous to their troops. They say they are aware that there might have been two other people in that vehicle who died as well. But so far, uh, that is the only thing we've really heard from the Israeli military uh, as groups that represent the rights of journalists overseas uh, are really crying foul about this operation. All right, Josh Letterman, thank you very much. Coming up, Olympic gold medalist Mary Lou Retton, one-on-one. -on -one. After the break, our own Hoda Kotb sits down with the American icon in an exclusive interview with NBC News on her recovery after a pretty scary brush with a rare form of pneumonia last year. Stay with us. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Olympic gold medalist Mary Lou Retton is on the mend after a life-threatening health scare with a rare form of pneumonia this past fall. She's now out of the hospital and recovering at her Texas home. Today, co-host Hoda Kotb sat down with Retton for an exclusive interview where she wanted to share a message of gratitude and hope. You know, I just thought I was a washed-up old athlete, but the love was just... It touched me. It touched me. To hear you say the words... I thought I was a washed up old athlete, mm. like hits me in the soul. Because I don't know if you are aware, 
but you are someone who people mark time with. You are someone who people have, um, you've, you've made such an indelible mark on people's lives. Mm. And I'm sure you have felt oh. the wave. I have. Yeah. I have. I mean, now that I'm alive <laughs> and I made it through, there were so many more positives than negatives. To see Mary Lou Retton's famous smile, you can't help but think about her standing atop that Olympic podium in 1984 in that red, white, and blue leotard and pixie haircut, the first American woman ever to win a gold medal in gymnastics, and the groundswell of pride and adoration America felt for her. She was on every magazine cover, in every ad. You only get out of it what you put into it. So energizing. And even the first woman athlete ever on a weedy cereal box. Well, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? <laughs> Wheaties, right, of right. course. She was America's sweetheart, and she set the stage for the golden age of American women's gymnastics, which continues its historic run today. That dream to stand up there on the medal stand and watch the flag rise and the, the national anthem play, I mean, that's what I worked a lifetime for, for that feeling, and it will never go away. And that warm feeling for Mary Lou has never gone away for many which is why it was so troubling when her daughters announced in October that their mother, a beloved icon, was fighting for her life in a Texas hospital with a rare form of pneumonia. Mary Lou's eldest daughter, Shayla, joined us for this interview because, quite simply, Mary Lou doesn't remember much of her month-long hospital stay. You have, an, you have an, a breathing apparatus, oxygen. I am on oxygen. I feel like you're in a very kind of vulnerable state. Very much so. But I'm very private. I know. And to come out and talk about it. And usually my interviews are, oh, yes, I, it yeah. felt great to win the Olympics, you know? Yeah, <laughs> this so. is different. This is serious and this is life. And I am so grateful to be here. Mm. I am blessed to be here. <laughs> because there was a time when they were about to put me on the life support. It sounds like you are and have been a very healthy human yes. being. How were you feeling in October before all this happened? The day before. We got she, our nails done. We got our nails done. Right. I was feeling tired, yeah. but I'm thinking, yeah, I turned 56 this month. I'm and you were very out of breath. Out of breath. The next day, Mary Lou was supposed to meet her daughters at a football game in Dallas, hours from her home. She never showed up. I couldn't. I literally was laying on my bedroom floor, and I said, I cannot. I can't do this. I didn't know what was wrong with me. What did you feel? I, I couldn't breathe. I you couldn't, catch your breath. I couldn't, like, you know how you want to just, I still can't, but yeah. take that big, deep breath in. You, you couldn't know, do it. I couldn't do it. I still can't do it. So but, what, were you, you were by yourself at home? I was by myself at home. But the luckiest of circumstances, a neighbor noticed a car door left open in her driveway and went to alert Mary Lou. And she came in the house. She knows my code and saw me and found me. Oh my Magda gosh. pretty much saved my life. I mean, I was, I don't know, what did she say? White and blue and I, yeah, I don't even remember it. You do you remember seeing her? I remember them coming in, um, but that's pretty much it. Mary Lou was taken to a local ER by the neighbor where she was admitted and diagnosed with pneumonia. It, it was a bad experience. It wasn't the greatest experience. No. What, what made it bad? I wasn't being treated. Oh. It wasn't taken as seriously as I think that it was. So a couple of days you were there, and then they, they sent her home. Me. They let you go home? Yes. And I had. Um, this is when things take a turn. The next day, Shayla discovered her mother almost unresponsive and rushed her to a bigger hospital in a nearby city, a name they wish to keep private. After discovering her oxygen levels were dangerously low and dropping, Mary Lou was immediately admitted to the ICU, where the medical team worked furiously to figure out what was wrong. She was tested for everything. Everything. COVID, flu. All of it. COVID, flu, you RSV, name it. all the things. All of the things. And it was nothing. Everything and, negative. And my x-rays. Oh, you should have seen it. The, the you first can't even one. see your lungs. Just completely white. 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 Completely mm -hmm. white. Okay. And I've never had a lung issue in my life. After a week of plummeting oxygen levels, Mary Lou's family says her medical team discussed putting her on a ventilator and advised them 
to prepare for the worst. They literally said. That, so yeah, she told me. Get Emma. You need to get your sister here. Because? Because we literally. don't know if she's gonna make it through the night. Literally, literally. And so McKenna and I, we put our hands on her and, and we said a prayer and. They were saying their goodbyes to me. Honestly. But I can't even, I mean, like. It was crazy. I'm so sorry. It was crazy. What did you say to your mom? I I just remember loving on you and giving you a hug and McKenna kept saying things like, it's okay, you can go. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it, I, you don't want to see me cry, ugly cry, <laughs> so. To know that your mom is in a, in a difficult situation is hard enough. Mm -hmm. To wonder how you're gonna pay for mm -hmm. it takes that problem and compounds it by yeah. a million. What was going on for you when that was happening? That's a great question. We were just thinking, you know, if she pulls through, the last thing we want her to have to think about is paying off these bills or doing anything like that. Mary Lou's daughters created an online fundraiser disclosing that Mary Lou did not have health insurance. A lot of people were surprised and um, that you didn't have insurance. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and also kind of sadden them. It's like, how is it possible right. that... Mm -hmm. Mary Lou Retton, who is America's sweetheart, mm -hmm. isn't taken care of in that way. Well, I mean, when COVID hit and after my divorce um, and all my pre-existing, mm -hmm. <laughs> all my, I mean, I've had over 30 operations of orthopedic stuff. I couldn't afford it. Couldn't afford it. Mm. <laughs> I that couldn't afford it. so sad. Mm -hmm. But who would even know that this was going to happen to me? That's the bottom line. I couldn't afford it. Oh, my gosh. That <laughs> Do you is, believe that? You know what? It just, it does show you that we're, so many people are all alike. You oh, know, In yes. so many ways. Yes. Life goes on. Yeah. And things happen. And at that, I just wasn't able to do it. I'm, I'm all set now. You have insurance, you're yes, good now. Yes, As Mary Lou's daughters prayed over her bed, doctors came in with a last-ditch idea to pump high-flow oxygen through her nose. So then what, what happened? You know, Hoda, <laughs> you know my mom, she's a fighter. She's the one in a million that wins the Olympics, but she's also the one in a million that <laughs> will get some rare form of pneumonia that you have no idea what it is, yeah. but she'll make it through. After a month in the hospital, Mary Lou's lungs began to heal enough for doctors to discuss her going home. They did tell you when you were in the hospital, if you could walk down the hall yes. with your oxygen, with you could go water. home. Yes. yes. So I know what you did. You <laughs> oh. were like, give it to me. Oh. Did she do it like that? Oh. Well, so that means Christmas was here. Christmas was here. Christmas wow. was here. What a gift. Oh, oh my girl. word. I mean, I'm not great yet. Yes. I know it's going to be a really long road. I don't know how long I'll indefinitely need the oxygen, but you have no idea how blessed and how grateful I was for this holiday season. Mm -hmm. And gratitude for the overwhelming love and support she received while in the hospital, both from donations and from prayers. And Mary Lou says she will use that joy to keep moving ahead in her recovery. I mean, when you face death in the eyes, mm. I have so much to look forward to. Yes, you do. I'm a fighter. Yeah, you are. And I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to give up. I have no idea what the future holds for me. I don't know if I'm going to have lasting issues with my lungs. I, they don't know. I mean, I wish I had answers, but I would never give up. Mm. It's not in me. Thanks to Hoda Kotb for that interview. Glad to see that she is doing oh, better. So we were so really how emotional. just surprised last year, and everyone. It sounds like she was as well, exactly. which is so interesting to hear that perspective from both her and her daughter. Incredible. And that holiday must have been absolutely magical oh, for absolutely. her family. Coming up, though, history is now headed to the moon. After the break, more on America's first lunar lander in more than half a century, with its sights set on the surface of the moon. That's next. Stay with us. Welcome back. This morning, history is being made. The first U.S. lunar lander in more than 50 years is on its way to the moon's surface. It blasted off earlier this morning from Cape Canaveral, hooked to a new rocket called 
the Vulcan. The lander is developed by a Pittsburgh-based company called Astrobotic Technology. The company hopes to be the first private business to land on the moon, and if it is successful, it will mark a major milestone in space exploration. Professor Jana Levin joins us now. She's a cosmologist and professor of physics and astronomy at Barnard College of Columbia University. Professor, good to have you with us. So tell us more uh, about this mission and, and the payload that it's carrying to the moon. Well, it's a very interesting moment, really, in the history of kind of near Earth or uh, lunar space travel, in that it's really relying on commercial missions. So NASA is collaborating with a commercial company both for the launch and for the lander. It's almost uh, as though it's just hiring this beginning to end delivery system. Now, NASA has five different experiments as payload on this mission, but there are 15 others that are commercial um, payload, and they are not run by NASA uh, nor overseen by NASA. So it's a really very different kind of time in the history of these kinds of lunar missions. Absolutely. I mean, it's creating so much excitement because of all these historic firsts, right? If all goes to plan, it marks yeah. the debut launch of this particular rocket, the Vulcan. And if that's successful, Astrobotic could become the first private company to achieve this controlled landing on the moon. I do understand that it does have some competition from a Houston company that has a lander ready to fly as well. Is there any possibility that lander gets to the moon first? Walk us through this competition yeah. in the private space. So this is very interesting. The competition used to be between countries, right? Mm -hmm. And there was all of this political warfare uh, going on and all of this sort of patriotism and symbolism. Um, this is now a kind of classic industrial commercial competition. Intuitive Machines is the company out of Houston that plans to launch mid-February on a SpaceX rocket. And uh, they'll take a more direct path to the moon. So this uh, mission is going to orbit the Earth a couple of times very quick, but then it goes into a very long orbit around the moon. And part of that is to take measurements, to gauge how things are going, but also to wait for some sunlight to fall on the landing site. And so they're due to land on February 23rd, but this other mission from Intuitive Machines, even if they launch mid-February, could just go on a direct shot and just try to land. And that's just classic competition between businesses now. Uh, Professor, this mission, it's sponsored by NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. What's that? Yeah. Clips. So NASA used to do everything, of course. And the last time NASA sent people to the moon was in 1972 with Apollo 17. But they did everything. They built the rockets. They built the machines. They, they oversaw the entire operation from beginning to end. And, of course, government agencies are also very risk averse. They don't necessarily have the ambition, the time, nor the public will to uh, have failures, to have disasters like we see repeatedly with SpaceX. So there's this sort of real big shift to say, you know, as commercial companies, you can take on that big risk factor and we'll, we'll uh, pay you for it and be um, basically in a rideshare situation with other commercial companies. So it's a completely new model. And I think there was a lot of concern that it wouldn't go as well if it wasn't NASA operated from beginning to end. But we've seen just an unbelievable explosion in commercial space flights. And it seems to be going kind of as the model would hope. Mm. All right, cool. Professor Levin, Good thanks news. so much Very for joining cool. us. We appreciate your time this morning. We sure do. Time for some financial headlines. Shares of Boeing saw a bit of a drop after Friday's mid-flight blowout. That's right. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us again with that and other news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Savannah Joe, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so shares of Boeing, they are under pressure, weighing on the markets. And the move coming after the FAA temporarily grounds dozens of 737 MAX jets as a panel blew out of an Alaska Airlines flight on Friday. Now, Boeing stock could have a very big impact on the Dow given the company's weighing in the index. Shares of Boeing rival Airbus moving higher in Europe today. Millions of Americans have been in credit card debt for at least a year. A new report from Bankrate shows nearly half of credit card holders are carrying a balance from month to month. 
more than half of those, or 56 million people, have carried debt for a year, up from 50% in 2021. Now, the most common reason for carrying debt, well, it's emergency or unexpected expenses, such as medical bills, car and home repairs, and that's followed by day-to-day -day expenses. And of those who have a credit card debt, less than half say they have a plan to pay it off. And Taylor Swift tops the king of pop, well, at the box office. The Eras Tour movie is now the top grossing concert film of all time, bringing in $261.6 million in theaters. Now, that surpasses the 2009 Michael Jackson movie, This Is It. The Eras Tour was on track to break the record from the start as it made $126 million worldwide in its opening weekend. Tickets cost $19.89 for adults. That's an homage to Swift's birth year and album of the same name and 1313 for kids because well 13 is her favorite number and I know you know all of that Savannah. So. <laughs> I sure do and I just love that even in that she weaves all that in. It's so good by the way. If you haven't seen it go it's a good time. <laughs> Thanks Savannah. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. You got it guys. Well turning now to take a look at the impact of female entrepreneurship on the economy with the release of Wells Fargo's 2023 impact of women owned businesses report. In the U.S. women owned businesses account for nearly 40 percent percent of all businesses in the country and this survey takes a look at their many accomplishments that help fuel our nation's economy. Joining us now to discuss is Val Jones. She is the senior lead business growth strategy consultant at Wells Fargo. Val, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us on this report. It's exciting to get to talk about it. So first, just take us through the findings here. What do they reveal about the state of female entrepreneurship right now? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to share. So. In this report, we really wanted to take a look at what has happened to women-owned businesses since the last report that took a look at this, which was from 2019. And I will tell you that a big surprise to me was how great things went for women-owned businesses during COVID. I was not expecting that at all. We saw growth in the number of businesses that opened up, which wasn't terribly surprising in that we heard a lot about folks starting businesses out of necessity or dealing with shifts in employment, et cetera. Um, but what we also found was tremendous growth in revenue and employment. So since the 2019 report came out, we added about a million businesses owned by women. We added about three million new jobs and we added about a trillion in revenue. So it was a really great experience for women owned businesses. Very surprising. Do you think there was a turning point that kind of shifted the scales to make this positive so far shift happen? Yeah, you know what, we saw a lot of things happen during COVID that didn't happen during the recession. One of the things the report looks at is comparing what happened during the recession versus COVID. Very, very different stories. So let's go back in time with COVID a little bit. At the very beginning of the pandemic, a lot of women-owned businesses were very hard hit. Many of were in the services industries, which were shuttered at the beginning, and many had problems accessing capital, even with PPP, et cetera. But mm. what we saw increasingly were government institutions, uh, corporations like Wells Fargo, Fargo and others and philanthropic giving, really taking a look at what can we do to support small businesses during this difficult time. And so we saw a lot of injection of capital. We saw a lot of support for organizations that provide technical assistance and, and information. And we just saw a lot of money go out there to provide support, not only for women owned businesses, but for all small businesses. And it really made a big difference. We talk a lot about closing the gap, about kind of bursting through that glass ceiling. Is there still room for improvement when it comes uh, to women in business, when it comes to female entrepreneurship? I know there is still kind of this disparity sometimes in, in money taken home at the end of the day, that type of thing when it comes, when you compare it with, with male owned businesses. What are you looking for there to kind of really see that gap close? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. We did see a lot of tremendous growth, but I don't want it to be that's the end of the story. To your point you're alluding to, there's still a lot of major gaps that remain, particularly in revenue and employment. We still see a lot of opportunity for women-owned businesses to catch up there. So in employer firms, there's a very small number of women-owned businesses that have employers, but the ones that do account for about half of the revenue of all women-owned businesses. It looks very different for our male counterparts. So what I think is we put the right inf infrastructure and information, resources, money in the right places during COVID, but we can't let our foot off the gas pedal. There are gaps that still remain and we still need to continue the great work we started. All right, Val Jones, thank you so much for joining us. Really a pleasure to get to talk with you about this and, and great to see some good news here. Thank you, we appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you.
Coming up, it's a tale of two tailgates as we head into the NFL's postseason. Yeah, after the break, a closer look at two of the most passionate fan bases in the league as they duke it out for playoff glory. Stick around. And Sam eating a burger. Stay for that. Stick around. Welcome back. Ariana Grande is saying thank you next as she reveals new music is arriving for fans this week. The singer announced the first single from her seventh studio album will be out on Friday. The track is called Yes And, and it will be Grande's latest drop of her own music since her album Positions back in 2020. Since then, though, she's taken on the role of Glinda the Good Witch in the highly anticipated film rendition of Wicked. She also launched her own beauty brand, Rem Beauty, and was featured on multiple hit tracks with artists like the weekend and Kid Cudi. We still don't have a release date or title for this next album, but we can expect to find out more soon. Pretty exciting. Big year ahead for her. That's definitely true. I know. Yeah. I can't wait for Wicked. All exactly. Right. All right. In the final week of the NFL's regular season, the Buffalo Bills beat the Miami Dolphins, clinching the AFC East title. Fans were no doubt celebrating after the game, but this morning we're taking a look at the festivities that took place before. The Bills and Dolphins each have passionate fan bases that love their football and their food. NBC's Sam Brock was outside Hard Rock Stadium in Miami, taking in two very different tailgate experiences. You might say it's the game before the game, the beloved tailgate. And here in Miami, you're really struck right away by the generosity of the fans sharing meals and drinks and, yep, even cigars. Now, the Buffalo Bills have the Bills Mafia, obviously. In Miami, we have the fun-loving Finns, which means things like dancing and VIP experiences and outfits that go for the win. With the NFL playoffs just days away, overnight, the final game of the regular season playing out in South Florida. A matchup of two top offenses and fierce AFC East rivals, the Miami Dolphins and Buffalo Bills, sizzling on the field where the Bills claim the division title. And sizzling off the field, too, where the Jarasco style meat and delightful bread with tomato or pan con tomate was flowing freely. Thank you, pan sir. Con tomate, pan con tomate. It certainly is a tale of two tailgates, making waves in Miami versus wilding out in western New York. Sure, there's still the face painting and fanatics. When a touchdown is scored by the Dolphins, what do you do? I go, I go maniac. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, dolphins, dolphins, ah! But Miami's tailgates also feature tables filled with people playing dominoes. Yeah. A cross-section of a layered community and cultures. Is this kind of like a melting pot? Yeah, Not just for Miami 100%. Friends. Naturally, cigars aren't hard to locate. We just got a guy who says he has the best cigars. Let's go check it out. All right, what do you got here, man? I got everything. I got my Garcia, the best one. <laughs> and because this is a shared experience, why not partake? Salute. The taste of Miami tailgates billowing out in many ways. <laughs> From club thumping beats to a VIP option in stalls that usually hold Formula One race cars, serving top tier meat for those that can shell out thousands. We could fit 100 people in every little stall. Though it's certainly not about the price of admission, but the depth of generosity that stands out. This Miami Dolphins tailgate town tent draws a huge crowd that donates all tips and proceeds to cancer research, a cause closely championed by the Dolphins. It doesn't matter who you're rooting for. The point is the winners are kids in this case. No one on the gridiron. Every time, every way. That's right. That team spirit, equally powerful for Buffalo Bills fans, known for their philanthropy. And as our Harry Smith found out at a Bills tailgate last season, for all sorts of theatrics, like those infamous table breaks, members of the Bills Mafia who traveled some 1,400 miles to get to South Florida couldn't necessarily explain it. Why is that a thing? I don't know. But the bond is admirable, even between long-standing rivals. Before the game, we met New Yorkers John and Eileen, who are getting married and root for opposite teams. We do our best as long as we're not playing each other to support each other's teams. And when we are playing each other, we try not to be vicious. Apparently, all's fair in love and war. And tonight's just another rehearsal to prepare ourselves for the Super Bowl, okay? We're gonna be there. And tailgates. 
Now, as you might have been able to tell, there were a lot of Buffalo Bills fans in attendance here. As it was explained to me, it's winter in Buffalo, but it feels like summer down here, about a 40-degree temperature difference for them. As for the actual game, the Bills win. They now clinch the number two seed. They take on the Pittsburgh Steelers at home. Sadly for the Miami Dolphins, they now go on the road and take on the Chiefs at Arrowhead. No home cooking there. In Miami, Sam Brock, NBC News. Back to you. Thank you, Sam. Tough assignment there. <laughs> Eating yeah, all the food. Smoking a cigar. Good for you, Sam. Good for you. We'll be here. <laughs> That's going to do it for this hour of morning news now. Stay with us, though, because the news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.